Welcome to Perspectives Online and On Air from WFSU Public Media. I'm Tom Flanagan. This program recorded on Thursday, September 3rd for playback, both on WFSU-FM and also the WFSU Public Media Facebook page on Thursday, September 10th. Wow, if nothing else, the pandemic has pushed our capabilities of coming up with new and creative solutions to what at first seemed insurmountable problems, kind of to the limit. And if you are in the arts, in the creative exercise thereof, it has been a real challenge to figure out exactly how do we do art gallery presentations and musical events and that sort of thing. That certainly holds true for the Tallahassee Symphony Orchestra, which has now moved ahead with a whole virtual season that is upcoming. And for those of you either watching us on Facebook or listening on the radio, it kicks off tomorrow, which is Friday the 11th. But there are still tickets available because the auditorium is infinite. And that's another <laughs> factor of all of this. So let's get the lowdown on the entire season from the folks uh, who are responsible for this whole thing. First, the CEO of the Tallahassee Symphony Orchestra, Amanda Stringer. Mandy, it is so good to see you, albeit virtually. It how, is how wonderful you, to see you too. How are you hanging other than the symphonic uh, uh, production through this entire thing? I think we're doing pretty well here at the office. We're doing our best to keep our spirits up and uh, feel really fortunate that we've been able to pivot quickly and that we have something to look forward to instead of just sitting around waiting um, to, till the time we can resume in person. Well, it is going to be certainly a challenge, but it is also going to, again, tap some of the creative instincts that otherwise may have atrophied as everyone looks at what's going on with the COVID situation. Uh, but we also have our music director and conductor of the Tallahassee Symphony Orchestra, who is rejoining us here on Zoom, and we'll zoom into uh, Darko Buderas. It is so good to see you, Maestro. How are you doing? Hi, Tom. It's great to see you, too. Wish, we're, wish it was in person, but uh, as you said, uh, uh, unexpected challenges bring unexpected solutions. And uh, I'm very excited about kicking off our season tomorrow. Before we get into a rundown of the season opener and the subsequent performances that are coming up, I, I have seen, uh, get back to the creativity again, some of the most fascinating iterations of musical talent on split screen online over the past almost six months now, where you do have entire symphonic presentations that are being done virtually. Is, was that the idea that you, you, you could do the same thing with the Tallahassee Symphony or even in, in smaller venues uh, by, by bringing the musicians together and saying, hey, we can't bring you to the auditorium, but we can bring the auditorium to you. Yes, exactly. I think uh, the so-called Zoom Orchestra, well, of course, it's very impressive. It's not the same experience, musically speaking. Um, for one, uh, the musicians are not able to play with each other. They're not able to work with each other. They don't hear each other. Um, so generally, the way it's done is through click tracks, and um, the flow of music simply does not click in the same way. Um, and so for us, when we decided and we were one of the first, if not the first orchestra in the entire United States to choose to go down this path. Um, we, we saw that as an artistic imperative that we deliver um, a feeling. The power of music has to be communicated as a group. Okay, we cannot be in a group together. Can we find ways to gather a smaller orchestra in a space that feels safe for everybody, for all the performers, for the musicians, and then still deliver a high-end product. That's really been our, our passion over the last four months. How do we find the best quality audio, the best quality video? How do we create something which is evocative of the professionalism you feel when you walk into Ruby Diamond in this unusual setting? And there's been many challenges, but it's been a joy in terms of the creative aspect of working on that. As you said, it spurs creativity. 
one of the things that orchestras typically do is we plan our season one year in advance. I sit down with uh, our committee, our artistic committee. Um, we involve the guest artists occasionally, and we just do it. This time, it's completely different. Um, the programs we are presenting this year are um, literally crafted by our guest artists. And the conversations back and forth I've had so far with you know, our fall guest artists have been so stimulating because literally there is no restrictions in terms of what we're programming. What, what are you passionate about? What piece do you wanna bring? Is there something new? Is there something unusual? Is there something popular? We're not placing any restrictions because we're not limited to the typical overture, concerto, symphony program. It's not possible to do the same thing anymore. And so the programs we're gonna present are gonna be far more varied. Uh, they're artist driven. And it's incredibly exciting to, to, to work on this. It's unlike anything else that our audience has seen in the hall so far. And I will throw in too that one of the other creative parts of it is that, that because we're using a small, smaller ensemble to keep people safe, um, there you'll be hearing some standard repertoire, but it's been reorchestrated um, for a smaller ensemble. So you're gonna hear it in a whole new way. And that, that part is exciting to me. And Mandy Stringer, this is really critical that there be a continuation, though, of a season for the Tallahassee Symphony. I have seen some musical groups, and including full orchestras around the country, that have essentially gone into chrysalis. And they're going, look, we, we, we can't do this. It is not possible. We're just going to put it on hold. And some of, uh, some of these orchestras may not survive. Yeah, it's a real concern. Um... I think that we're very fortunate that we pivoted as early as we did. I saw colleagues across the country just petrify over the summer. Um, and partially because their boards of directors would not let them allow them to act quickly. Um, and people wanted to be careful not to have a, I guess, for lack of a better term, a knee jerk reaction to what was going on. Um, but our board was very forward thinking. And as soon as Darko and I went to them and said, hey, we don't think there's going to be any in-person concerts for a while. And this is what we'd like to do. Um, they immediately agreed to let us go full steam ahead with this new format. So what was I like, Darko, to put this together, to contact all of those people and say, hey, are you guys open for this? Would you be available? The logistics must have been pretty daunting. Um Actually, I think that was one of one of our driving factors is we realized musicians typically have calendars that are full two, three years out, especially the really top ones. And we were very fortunate with having the board and the staff on top of this in reaching out to guest artists who are incredible. Our season this year, it happens to be our 40th anniversary season. It's more star-studded than anything we've ever done before. The, the people we're bringing to Tallahassee to perform are just incredible. And I, I cannot be more thrilled for that silver lining of the whole situation. Their calendars opened up. We called at the right time. And we presented an opportunity while the entire business was shutting down and just canceling. We were actually offering an opportunity for an artist to say, here, we can guarantee this gig. This is going to happen and it's going to be fun and it's going to be safe. And uh, pretty much everybody we reached out to responded positively and we will bring them to town. It's gonna to be such a big thing for our community to, to be able to experience this. And that's actually, you know, th that drives me to a very important point. Um, there's the element of um, the crisis brings need in a population. And one of the things that's unusual about the place we're in is the isolation aspect from community. And you think how much music has played a part of being human from the very, very beginning. In fact, there's evidence that music comes before speech. That's what sociologists believe is music evolved before speech evolved. Our speech comes out of music. And um, not to be able to present it is just tragic. So for us, it's not just about doing business as usual. It's about the service at a time when people are down, when people are tired. I, I am tired, I'm, I'm low energy on, on things. I mean, it, it cannot help but affect the, the situation. And for us to be able to come in 
and offer our season as usual, actually more concerts than usual in a season for this year because it's this anniversary. And to be there and to say, we're with you. We're gonna share in this experience. We're gonna get through this together. And here is some incredible music performed by some of the best artists currently available in the world <laughs> is really exciting for me. And, and I'm, I'm sure uh, Mandy can speak further to that. Yeah, I was just going to say that we're, we're going to be doing all sorts of things to, to make our audience even more connected to the music and to our musicians because we're able to now. We can get with the cameras that we're using, we can get up and close to the musicians so you can get closer to, the, to their physicality than you could if you're sitting, you know, several yards back at a concert hall. We're going to be um, doing interviews with the guest artists and that'll be part of the program. So there are all sorts of things that we're going to do to try to make it a more personal experience or a different kind of personal experience for the audience. Um, and this is kind of a fun fact. I believe our first artist, Larry Brownlee. So he is one of the leading tenors in the entire world. And we have, Darko and I have always jokingly said, Oh, wouldn't it be great to get Larry Brownlee to Tallahassee? Because this is crazy. He lives in Niceville, Florida, although he's hardly ever there. You know, he's usually on the stage of the Metropolitan Opera or something. So, and Darko knows him from school. So early on, we, we called and said, let's just make this a long shot and see if he'll drive over. And sure enough, he's totally out of work right now. And so he was perfectly willing to come and sing with us. And um, he's told us that this is the first in-person concert he will have done since March. So this is going to be, um, you know, very cathartic for him as well as all of us and our musicians. Before we get into the overview of Larry Brownlee as the season opener for the Tallahassee Symphony's 2020-2021 uh, season, Mandy, tell folks how they can obtain tickets individually or collectively for all the performances upcoming. It's super easy. You just go to our website and it'll say buy tickets here. Um, the, se the season is six concerts. It's inexpensive compared to our normal season. You can get all six concerts. If you're a renewing subscriber, we're selling the ticket for $250 for the season. Brand new people can get all six concerts for $150. And that is per household. So you're, you can share that with other folks at your, at your home. So it's really inexpensive and it's easy. Um, we also have single tickets on sale for each event and those are $25. Let's we go should mention, the, oh, go ahead, uh, TallahasseeSymphony.org. Just in case people yes. don't know, TallahasseeSymphony.org is their website mm -hmm. and all the information there. It's really easy. Uh, you know, uh, we've done all our research in terms of finding platforms that are stable and offer the best audio and video experience. Um, I'm really proud how the Tallahassee Symphony has handled this crisis and uh, what, what we have been able to put together in such a well, short tell time. Us, tell us about your old buddy, Larry Brownlee, and what he is going to be bringing to the stage of, I believe, Goodwood uh, tomorrow evening, 7.30, right? Yes, that's correct. So uh, Lawrence Brownlee, uh, as Amanda alluded to earlier, is the leading bel canto tenor worldwide. He's graced the stages of Metropolitan Opera, La Scala, uh, Paris Opera. He, he was featured on some of the, uh, really the world's biggest stages. And um, so uh, I remember we went to school together at Indiana University um, about, I guess, 20 years ago. And uh, I was studying conducting. Conductors at the time had to be in a chorus, we couldn't be an orchestra. We had to observe orchestras, so we, our ensemble had to be a chorus. And given that Indiana was such a big opera school, um, I, was, I chose to be in the opera chorus, which is great fun because, you know, I, for people who don't know, Indiana University presents eight productions, full stage productions per year. The stage is as large as the Metropolitan Opera. It is full professional production. And so, you know, when you're in the opera chorus, you're wearing all these cool costumes and you're part of the action and working with the best uh, stage directors and conductors in, in the business. And my first opera that I did was Faust. And Larry was Faust in Gounod's Faust. And it was electric. It was, to this day, it's like my great, you know, opportunity as a performer <laughs> was that I sang in in the opera chorus behind, behind Larry Brownlee in, in this production. 
And that spring, he won the Metropolitan Opera Guild uh, uh, competition, and that launched his career. And, you know, he's been a star ever since. In fact, I think just this summer, he graced the cover of Opera News magazine again. So um, it's, it's incredible to bring him. The program is going to be something like you would have seen with Pavarotti or the Three Tenors concerts. So there will be a set of um, opera arias to begin. We will end with a set of popular songs, things like O Sole Mio, Granada, you know, really this like three tenor repertoire. But then in between, which is really special, uh, is Larry will do a set of spirituals, which is something that's very close to his heart and uh, he performs quite a bit. And we're just thrilled to be able to, to uh, bring him to Tallahassee and to share his gift with our community. Tenor Lawrence Brownlee, the season opener, Friday, September 11th, uh, tomorrow, 7.30, uh, the uh, season opener for Tallahassee uh, Symphony, which will then get us to next month, Friday, October 23rd. And uh, I think there was an individual who is on this call with us right now who is a, a very accomplished uh, cellist. And so uh, I... I Guess that's why Joshua Roman is going to be the featured artist on uh, on the October presentation, huh, Darko? Yes, Josh Roman uh, made history by being one of the youngest print cello, uh, principal cellists in a major in a major American orchestra. I think, uh, Mandy, remind me, was it age nineteen he became principal of Seattle Symphony? Something like that. It was nineteen it, or twenty. It's, yeah. it's just insane. Uh, you know, you heard stories like this happening in the 40s and 50s after the war when young people were, were becoming leaders of orchestras. But in this day and age, to, to have a teenager as, as a leader of a major symphony orchestra was just unheard of. And I think he only stayed there a few years and his solo career just blossomed. And, um, you know, um, we're currently finalizing the program for next month that's taking place in October. Um, Josh Roman is very passionate about presenting new music because he himself is a composer. And this for me brings up a different uh, issue is it's really rare to find these days a great soloist who is also an accomplished composer. It's the, the, the job descriptions have kind of veered off um, in the business. But if you look at the great composers, mostly they were great performers. Mozart, mm -hmm. Beethoven, uh, Brahms. Liszt. All f Liszt. Tchaikovsky, amazing musicians as well as composers. And um, at first I was skeptical, you know, I don't know, we don't usually present that much new music on a concert. Josh played some of his clips of his pieces for me and I was, both of us were just like, oh my God, we have to do this. Because it's, it's immediate, it's engaging, it's his voice, authentic. And one of the things that I love about his pieces is the amount of content for the amount of time the piece takes place is logical. Sometimes you have pieces that sound too long for the time they're written. <laughs> you know, it seems like five minutes is interminable. And sometimes five minutes feels like uh, it's just a, a flash of, a, of, a, of an eyelid uh, because the content is so engaging. And that's what Josh's music is like. So we'll do, he will present some of his music we will do a cello concerto. I think we're talking about CP Bach A minor concerto, which is like Baroque rock and roll. And then again, there'll be some popular music tossed in. So it will be a, a very exciting concert. Tom, one thing I didn't want to forget uh, for the listeners, in case you're not able to make the time of the concert, we present the concert at 7.30 PM, for example, tomorrow. But uh, because it's a digital content, we actually keep it up for 48 hours. So if you have an engagement on Friday night, you can, uh, listen to it anytime over the weekend. You can watch the performance anytime over the weekend. So that's an important thing to remember. Time zones, anything else, if you're traveling, if you have uh, uh, you know, dinner plans or something like that, um, it really have 48 hours to, to view the concert. So it, it really is a great opportunity. You can also rewatch it for a second thrill. <laughs> yes. Well, and, and this pushes the envelope too, because this is something you cannot do with a live performance. Are, are we spoiling the audience that, you know, well, hey, you know, we went to Ruby Diamond when we, you know, finally get back to a more traditional way of uh, of consuming this content. And, 
you know, or I'm, I'm going to be out of town that, uh, that weekend. Can't you guys just, you know, send me the, uh, the, the redo of it virtually, you know? Yeah, I think okay. that one of the things that's exciting about this for me is that for many years, we've known that we need to get into this digital space, but it's expensive. It's, you know, it's time consuming. It's a whole new skill set. So in some ways, this pandemic has offered us a pause and the opportunity to learn how to use the technology. Um, and I think moving forward, once we're back together again, we'll continue to so that people that are home or for whatever reason can't be in the concert hall will be able to in enjoy it. So that that is one of the silver linings in all of this. And, and, and of course, you then have the the monumental YouTube archive and some of the other platforms where people can go back and re-enjoy music and other performance art over and over again. So yes, uh, time shifting has kind of become our, our way of the world. Well, that brings us to the end of time for 2020, which is the annual Tallahassee Symphony Orchestra Holiday Magic which has become, I don't know, um, uh, Mandy, this, this goes back many, many years, but this is kind of one of the season highlights for any TSO season is what happens right around the holidays. And, and this year is going to be no exception there either. It's going to be fantastic. We have one of our very, very favorite guest artists. She's performed with us more than any other guest artist we've had. Her name is Mickey Sodergren. She is an amazing singer, super versatile voice. Um, the um, audience members who are familiar with our product will remember that she's done a Broadway show with us. She's done an Oscars, not at the Oscars with us. And she's also sung Holiday Magic with us before. So we've had her here three times, thrilled to have her back a fourth. She's going to put on the phenomenal show. She too is curating her own show. And she's also bringing with her, we're calling it Mickey Sodergren and Friends, because she's bringing along two of her uh, friends that are also amazing, excellent musicians. One is Michael Malia Kill, and he sang the Broadway show with her. People might remember that, um, and, and everyone just loved him. And then she's also bringing a pianist friend of hers named Nat, Nat Zegri. And so it's going to be a really, really fun show, and people will not want to, it's going to definitely cheer, cheer everyone up at that time of year when we're all going to be ready for some something different and some new cheer. Yeah, we, we should remind the audience, Michael Malachio was uh, on the National Phantom Tour uh, for years um, and is just an incredible singer. Mm -hmm. uh, Nat's agree is, uh, you know, when I watch the movie Amadeus and I see like young Mozart, that's what Nat reminds me of because he can sit at the piano and improvise, engage, sing, it's he's just an electric performer so i think the three of them is going to be uh, a real fun show to enjoy uh come the holidays and because they're friends they feed off each other's energy so i think that's yes. another nice thing about it yes absolutely yeah there's there's no substitute for that kind of chemistry you can have some of the the greatest artists on the planet but if there is something a little off in their personal interaction that can really mess up the performance for sure <laughs> saturday december 19th again 7 30 but will be archived for 48 hours there after the holiday magic show uh, of the tallahassee symphony with mickey michael and nat the um, the great trio who will be uh, performing on that one a brand new year then begins that gets us into january and uh we are back in the string section it looks like darko for the uh, 23rd uh yes we welcome blake pouliot who is uh a rising violin star he uh recently won the montreal competition which is one of the top violin competitions worldwide um and uh prior to the shutting down of covid we had already booked him to perform the Sibelius Concerto with us this September. He was supposed to be our season opener. Lo and behold, literally a couple of weeks later, the Atlanta Symphony books him for the same piece. And I believe that's the last concert he had. It was in February, was uh, his debut with the Atlanta Symphony. So, I mean, this guy is phenomenal. I worked with him a year ago in Nashville. Uh, we performed uh, the Piazzolla Four Seasons electric performer he is as tall as i am um and just uh, captures a, 
is magical on the stage, but his uh, his musicianship is just astounding. The technique is spotless, but there is a passion behind it. There is a fire behind it. Um, if you take a look at our season preview video uh, on the TSO Facebook page or on our website, um, there's a clip of him playing Ravel's Tzigan. And it's just with piano. It's in a small uh, CB CBC studio in, in Toronto. And the audience just like is lit on fire. That's the kind of performer he is and uh, can't wait to, to work with him again. It's, it's like seeing Paganini, reborn. <laughs> yes, he's actually a redhead. So uh, <laughs> he, he just, Paganini was a redhead, by the way. Uh, yeah, uh, so maybe a little shorter hair, but okay, it's 2020. <laughs> <laughs> the violin, of course, has been the preeminent voice of the orchestra, predating, I mean, uh, uh, even the Baroque period going way, way, way back. There is just something... Again, we've talked about this, Darko, so human about the string section, whether it's your own instrument, the, uh, the cello, the viola, or the violin that has certainly sparked a lot of composers to put their very best efforts into writing for solo stringed instruments. And that seems to continue today, even with all the advancements we have had in orchestral orchestration. Um, there's still something about the violin that is just incomparable when it comes to its ability to, to capture the essence of human emotion and the human condition and to get that out to everyone. And so that, that's going to be really exciting to have uh, someone like Blake who's uh, coming in and giving us his uh, you know, contemporaneous take on an instrument that is nearly as old as time. I love it. I couldn't agree more. We are now into February, ah, the month of love, and uh, the Tallahassee Symphony's season is going to have a loverly concert on the very Valentine's Day celebration itself. Mandy, who's, who's going to be performing? So for that concert, we are bringing back the group Time for Three, and they have also been with us before. Um, they were a huge audience favorite, and we're here in Darko's first year as music director. So Darko, what year would that have been? 2012? Uh, it was the spring of 2014 that we first performed with Time for Three. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay, so yeah. they are, they consist of two violins and a bass, unusual combination, um, and are just great, great fun. Um, they typically don't play a lot of classical music. They're Back in the day, they were considered crossover artists. Now we just um, kind of refer to them as totally outside the box because they actually now have started incorporating singing into their um, numbers. And so they are going to be great fun. And they are, we haven't put our, together their program yet, but they have sent me some ideas. They've had some music orchestrated recently with another orchestra that they want to present to us to see if we're interested. Um, and it should just be a great fun way to enjoy a Valentine's uh, day with your sweetie indoors and safely. <laughs> yeah, that, that is one time of the year where social distancing perhaps is, is not really indicated. <laughs> uh, <laughs> For sure. Uh, uh, tell, for, for those who aren't familiar with Time for Three, Darko, give us a, a quick thing on, on uh, Nick and Charles and uh, Ronan and how, how they interact with that, as Mandy said, kind of unorthodox uh, ensemble that they have. Well, what I loved about this is this is, uh, this is kind of a typical music conservatory story. Uh, every great music school in the world has a practice building. And uh, practice buildings is where students go and isolate themselves and practice for hours on end. It's, it, you know, there's no uh, progress as a musician without serious uh, time devoted to this. But of course there are limits and inevitably you see your friends in the practice room. So the practice building also becomes uh, a kind of social space. And what happened with Time for Three is they were in their practice rooms and then during breaks, they would goof around. And we're talking about, I mean, incredible musicians, just incredible musicians, not just able to play, let's say, what's written on the page, but able to improvise, able to evoke different styles. And so they started to doodle. It's like, oh, let's just jam together. Let's jam together and play popular music, or let's jam together and improvise on, on, uh, on like a Bach piece or something like that. 
And one thing led, led after another, and it's a very unusual formation, but that's who it was. It was two violins and a bass player. There's no, I mean, to my knowledge, this is a unique instrumentation. Usually it would be, you know, violin, viola, cello, or, you know, violin, piano, cello is the, is the common string trio. So these were just the guys who were in the practice room. They started uh, playing around, you know, with different pieces of music and were great at it, uh, are able to really play in many different styles, are incredibly engaging. And uh, in fact, I think it's the best group. Uh, Mandy, Mandy, I don't know, I, I guess you'll agree with me, probably the best group for a virtual season because oh, yeah. they are completely tuned in to uh, technology and into um you know kind of beyond the concert hall experience so and that, yeah I, I'm they so were already you. in the space before this happened um exactly and i can offer a follow-up to what darko was just saying which is even uh, an even better part of the story they were actually in school at the curtis institute and they were all playing in the philadelphia orchestra together and the story is that one night the power shut down in the middle of a concert of the philadelphia orchestra and they needed a way to keep the audience occupied while they figured out what was going on. So these guys come out from the orchestra to the front of the stage and start playing together. And everyone's like, what the heck? I, we didn't know this was going on over there. So that was how Time for Three was actually born officially. Wow. That is a great story. It, 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 it takes me back to my band days when the, we, we'd blow a fuse <laughs> you know, on one of our gigs. And uh, of course, I'm the drummer. And so I'm the only <laughs> one playing. You know, everyone else is shut down and got to keep the beat going. So the dancers didn't care. You know, you just keep them going. The Valentine's Day concert, Sunday, February 14th, the Valentine's Day special with the TS. So Time for Three will be performing, and that brings us to the conclusion of the season, Saturday, March 27th, the, the grand finale. Who's up for that, Darko? Uh, one of the greatest pianists worldwide, John Kimura Parker. Uh, John Kimura Parker, uh, many of our listeners will, will be familiar with the name. He's graced the stages of every continent. He plays a lot in Europe, uh, in Asia, in Japan, in Canada, in the U.S. Uh, really uh, uh, phenomenal pianist. Uh, Mandy knows him better personally. I, I, I only met him through Zoom, uh, but it was wonderful to meet him. So engaging, uh, so kind. Oftentimes when you work with the artists who are at the very top, you find out they're really incredible human beings. And that was my, my memory of that interaction. So I cannot wait to be in the same place and make music together. We talked about um, really kind of brainstorming through programs. One of the things uh, that he's passionate and he's gonna bring to us that we're very excited about is um, his Wizard of Oz fantasy. Now, <laughs> if we look at uh, the greatest pianist of the 19th century, Franz Liszt. Franz Liszt was kind of the first modern virtuoso. What did he do? He took popular music from his time, which were opera arias. Opera was the popular form of the 19th century. Who was the greatest opera composer? Like Verdi, okay. What's Verdi's great opera? Rigoletto, okay. So Liszt would write a fantasy of Rigoletto that was showcasing his chops and the audience already knew the tunes. If we play Liszt's Rigoletto Fantasy now, we, we admire the virtuosity, but not all of us know the tunes. We're, we don't make the association. But we do know the Wizard of Oz. We know Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And so when you hear it played in a super virtuosic fashion, it's incredibly impressive. This piece was actually written for John Kimura Parker as a four hands piano arrangement. So for two players. He asked then the arranger, oh, would you mind making it just for me? Because audiences really like this. And he did, but he didn't leave any of the notes out. So what you're going to see is the Wizard of Oz, Oz fantasy that's written for two people played by one person. It's going to be unbelievable. It's I'm stunning. so excited about that. Yeah, we've yeah. seen little clips of it. It's just, you can't, it, yeah. you blink and you miss it. It's, his, <laughs> his fingers are flying so fast. It's amazing. Well, that is uh, John Kimura Parker, uh, Saturday, March 27th, to wrap up a very um, unorthodox virtual season for the Tallahassee Symphony Orchestra. And Mandy, I got to ask you, how are the, the TSO musicians 
weathering this this COVID storm? Are they still getting together in small socially distanced groups and rehearsing, or uh, exactly what's going on with the with, with the home musician folks? I think they're being pretty careful. I think that all of us are a little, you know, we want to make sure that we do our part to keep everyone safe. Um, the ones that, that um, are faculty at FSU, I know so many of them are teaching virtually this semester. They've been given the, the, cha the choice to do that. Um, you know, and to be honest with you, Tom, as you know, this is tough times for musicians, especially ones that do a lot of freelancing because the work is dried up. So I know that the ones that are playing this concert are really, really excited to get together and play again. Um, and to also make a little money, which is nice. Um, but, you know, we, we're keeping them at the front of our thoughts and prayers because it's really, really, it's a really tough time for them. And it's, um, you know, it's going to be several more months before we come out of this. So we're doing our best to take care of them during this time and make sure there's a Tallahassee Symphony um, once, once we get through this pandemic. And you got to yeah, miss it too, Darko. Yeah, because you, I mean, you stand in front of those folks and and lead them in into new heights of, you uh, in incredibleness, if you will, and and we can't have that right now. No, the uh, you think of all the crisis humanity has ever changed. We've always had music. This is the first time in history of humanity we do not have music. We do not have live music as part of our lives. It's it's horrible. And as I said at the beginning of our program, the fact we're able to do what we're able to do, I'm so proud. I'm so proud of the Tallahassee Symphony. I'm so proud of my colleague Mandy and you know the way we work together to 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 be able to create this. It's one of my great musical moments in my life that we're able to present this. And um, concerts are necessary to help us reflect and to help us to cope and to help us to bridge the tough times. And we're going to be there for Tallahassee. And uh, for our musicians as well. I, I cannot imagine what it's like to be a performing musician who depends entirely um, on music for their livelihood. It is horrible. And um, we're doing everything we can to, to stay fiscally responsible, as Mandy said, so we can be there as soon as possible and bring the whole orchestra back on stage when it's safe to do so. The season opener for the Tallahassee Symphony tomorrow night, Friday, September 11, 7.30, tenor Lawrence Brownlee, and then the rest of the season follows a pace. Again, uh, Mandy Stringer, how do you get tickets for any of the individual performances or the whole shebang? So, yeah, thank you for bringing that up again. You go to our website at tallahasseesymphony.org. Or um, you can also access tickets from our streaming platform, and the web address for that is watch.tallahasseesymphony.org. And I also wanted to make folks aware that Darko is going to be doing a pre-concert talk as per usual for this, uh, this event, and they, that will be a, a, available to stream at 7 o'clock that night. So you can buy your ticket early, get on, hear Darko's chat, and then move on to the concert. Darko, it is wonderful to see your again and I hope that you and I can continue our relationship in and around the uh, the holiday magic concert we can do this yes. via zoom you can zoom in and bring your favorite sounds of the season I'll do the same from uh, my end and we'll uh, we'll put that back together again as well uh, you got a deal Amanda, I'd love to Amanda Stringer the CEO of the Tallahassee Symphony Orchestra and music director and conductor Darko Buteras, thank you all for coming on and talking about the upcoming season of the Tallahassee Symphony Orchestra online, as are we, and we will talk to you guys real soon. Again, thank you for keeping music alive, even in this virtual space under these remarkable circumstances. Perspectives uh, production of WFSU Public Media in Tallahassee. Thanks going out to Taylor Cox, who was pushing the buttons today and making it happen. Also, thanks to Paul Dam, Amy Diaz de Diegas, Trisha Moynihan, and Lydell Rawls. And I'm Tom Flanagan. On our next Perspectives, we're going to be heading virtually to the wilds of the Apalachicola River Basin. We're going to be talking about the annual River Trek, an event that focuses more awareness on this incredibly unique environment and why it is so important. We invite you to join us then on air and online for perspectives from WFSU Public Media. Take care.